The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another week of Fantasy NBA Today. This is a hoop ball presentation. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. Happy to dive back in for another five episodes. Got to loosen up the vocal cords up this morning. It's weird. I feel like uh, strange. Actually, it kind of feels like I haven't done a podcast in like three weeks. And I know it's only been a couple of days, but that's whatever. That's how I feel. You guys can't do anything about it. You can follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. And you can follow hoop balls fantasy news feed which catches everything and gives you the fantasy breakdown of it at hoop ball fantasy this is are we week 16 now could that be right that can't be right can it yeah holy crap all right we're into week 16 it's the stretch run i guess teams are around 50 games played we're about two-thirds of the way through the season now and so you're coming down the chute. There are you're at the point where you kind of need to make your move. If you're in a roto league, you got to figure out what stats you can be attacking. If you're in a head-to-head league, you got to start shoring up for the playoffs. And hopefully your teams aren't as beat up as a couple of mine are. There are a lot of guys out right now. And unfortunately, many of them fall into the Dan Bespris overlap category, so we're just sort of gritting our teeth and riding it out as best we can. It is, of course, Reverse Chronological Lightning Round Monday, so we'll dive into that here momentarily. I want to start the podcast, however, by once again reminding everybody that we are recruiting at Hoop Ball, and we are recruiting hard. And if the notes on it last week didn't do the trick, perhaps today is the day where you hear me on this pod and think, you know what, Dan is freaking right. I should hit him up. So bug me on Twitter, at Dan Bespris, or email Team Hoop Ball at hoop-ball.com. If you feel like today's the day you want to start your new life as a fantasy analyst, either full season or DFS. We do need DFSers as well. Uh, it is, I mean, it's a grind. Here's the thing. Like, you got to be ready to go every day for an entire basketball season. That's not, this is not something you do just when you feel like picking it up and putting it down. This is something, if, if you want this to be part of your existence, This is a wonderful way to break in. So again, hit me. Hit me if you are so inclined. Hit me if you're so inclined. And let's get this party started. At Dan Bespris or email Team Hoop Ball at hoop-ball.com. For those uninitiated, reverse chronological lightning round Monday, we go backwards through the weekend, starting with the games on Sunday. Then we work backwards through Saturday. And if we need to go to Friday, just if anybody didn't happen to play over the uh, Saturday-Sunday weekend, we will... Get those as well. Every team's most recent basketball game to get you guys reset for the week ahead so you know what we're looking for and what we found out. Let's begin. Brooklyn at Chicago was the early game on Sunday. Brooklyn decided it would be a good idea, the harebrained notion, to say the least, to start both LaMarcus Aldridge and Blake Griffin in a 2021-year basketball game, and it went about as you'd expect, which is that Chicago shot 55% for the game. Everybody got off to a good shooting day, and they really weren't able to slow them down from that point forward. I get it. I get it. You want to give your old goats an opportunity to do some stuff, and you want to make them feel appreciated, but Steve, talking, of course, to Steve Nash, we are, you know, me and Steve, we're on a first-name basis at this point. Steve, That's not the way. That's not the way. From a fantasy perspective, I I do feel like LaMarcus Aldridge has a chance to hold value in Brooklyn. Kevin Durant, apparently not that far away. But LaMarcus is sort of the first in the pecking order in that center gig. He's moved in front of uh, Nick Claxton. No surprise there, the young fella, even though... By all accounts, Claxton, a far better defensive player than LaMarcus Aldridge. But it seems like they're probably going to use LaMarcus. Jeff Green kind of backing up the power forward in the center spots right now. And I'm guessing that when KD comes back, you probably see Blake Griffin as uh, in that same kind of role. 
And things are only going to get more complicated here. Still, I think Aldridge plays more than half the ball game. It was a 27 minutes in this one. That's probably around the target number for him. And that'll be pretty darn close to fantasy value. So I think Aldridge you can grab. Blake Griffin, no. Sounds like James Harden is coming back, so that'll shake things up a little bit more again. But that's where you stand with Brooklyn. On the Chicago side, with Kobe White now in health and safety protocols, that means Tomas Sadoransky is sort of the one remaining point guard now, outside of Ryan Arcidiacono, who played a grand total of three minutes yesterday. And then they'll run, you know, Troy Brown will run a little point, Zach Levine will run a little point, Thad will kind of run point as your power forward. Thad Young had foul trouble early in this game, otherwise he ended up with a pretty solid performance, 12-5-5 and with a block. Lowry Markinen played just 23 minutes off the bench. I'm getting questions about whether you should be dropping Markinen, and I think the answer is no, because, uh, well, first of all, Daniel Tice actually backed up Thad Young in this game. Markinen was basically uh, backup center minutes and then a smattering of power forward minutes in there. He's looking at probably about a 24-minute role on this team going forward, but I do still think that as he settles into that bench role, he's going to kind of be the bench conqueror of this team. And so I actually believe that Markinen is at a little bit of a buy low right now. I wouldn't expect all that much from him in 24 minutes, but if teams are considering dropping him then that means you can get him on the ultra cheap and whatever he does at that point ends up being somewhat useful for your team. So throw Markin in on the short list of guys. We can look at potential buy prices and we'll do some of that on social media today. That's we'll we'll take some of that over into the social space to sort of, you know, all these shows nowadays have their kind of after hours where they, they do questions after the show on TV, right? We do that over on social media. We'll port that over there. So put Markin in down on the list. I'm typing his name right now, so I remember because I often forget. Uh, and we'll do a little bit more on Lowry uh, at Dan Vespers again. That's over on Twitter. Sato is an obvious start here with Kobe White out. This is as good as it's going to get for him, though. He's not going to shoot 8 for 10 every ball game. He's not going to have 11 assists every ball game. But it raises his floor because now there's just no way his minutes drop below 28 or 29 with no Kobe White for... You know, we don't entirely know how long. It could be a one-day thing where maybe there was a weird test of a family member or something, or we might be waiting a week to see if he catches COVID. And if he does, then he's, you know, basically out until through probably into the playoffs. And if he doesn't, then we'll see him, you know, about six days from now. Troy Brown Jr. played 28 minutes in this ballgame. That's something to keep a side eye on. He has a versatile fantasy game, but he's not going to get to do all that much with this team or seemingly any team, uh, but keep a watch on that just in case. And Patrick Williams plays a lot of minutes, but doesn't do a whole lot with them. Battle for LA was also an early game on Sunday. Kawhi was good. Marcus Morris was excellent. He had 22 and seven. And if he can stay on the floor, it seems like they're giving him some back-to-backs off. And I don't know if that's going to be every back-to-back going forward, but uh, he was a guy that we were a little bit ahead of the curve on, on this show, because generally he's been, a pretty boring fantasy player, particularly since he got traded to L.A. last season. But over the last two weeks, in 30 minutes a game, he's right on the edge of the top 100. That's a startable fantasy asset no matter what 12-team situation you're in. That puts him right at the start of the ninth round, meaning top 100. That should be your ninth best player on your fantasy team, averaging 18 points, four boards, and four three-pointers. The field goal percent will be lower. The free throw percent will be higher. By the way, those are at 53 and 73, respectively. So those will, one will go down, one will go up. And steals and blocks, while I know he's not going to get many, 0.2 and 0.2 is also on the low side for him. So it'll all level out, and he's playing at a better than top 100 level these days and belongs on fantasy teams. And that's what I said. Look, if this guy can get 12 shots a ball game, he can be fantasy valuable. And he's at 12.7 over the last week with a couple of missed games in there. And he's at exactly 12 over the last two weeks. That's the number. That's the hot number for him. That gets him to startable. If he's a Zubats, yeah, you're continuing to roll him out there. We have no idea what the deal is with Serge Ibaka at this point. Terrence Mann is now going to lose his role as point forward off the bench because Rajon Rondo came in, turned it over four times in 13 minutes. But that's his job now. 
that's going to cut into Reggie Jackson's production. Uh, and if Pat Beverly ever resurfaces, it would cut into his production as well. So that Clippers point guard spot, really all the guards, assuming we call Paul George a small forward, which I guess is probably not right. Uh, so all their point guards and backup stuff is just uh, a mess at this point. On the Lakers side, you know, they're counting it down. They're counting it down to getting any of their star players back. I said on Friday's show, and then I got a bunch of questions about it, which, you know, reasonably so, because it was a it was a pretty hot, hot take of the Anthony Davis potential buy recommendation. I want to repeat again today, because I think there it felt like there was a little bit of confusion. Don't go get Anthony Davis if you're already winning your league. If you're winning your league, and I know it's boring, don't screw it up on purpose. Don't do something harebrained if you're already beating everybody. Do small things around the edges. Look and see what stats people are chasing you on. If you're in a roto league or in a head-to-head, if you're out in first place, look to see where you could shore one thing up and maybe sacrifice on a stat where you're not as good. Don't blow it up. Even if I do still believe you can get Anthony Davis on the extraordinarily cheap right now, like you could probably get him for a top 75 type of player, you know, try throwing uh, Lonzo out there and you might get Anthony Davis back. That's by totals. Let's go by, let's go per game. You could probably even go cheaper. Lonzo's 52 on a per game basis. Uh, Try, I don't know, Marcus Smart. He's number 75. Try... I don't know. Karis LeVert, number 84. People love him way more than they should. He hurts you in both percentages. See if you can get Anthony Davis for Karis LeVert, who you probably picked up, stashed him for a couple of weeks. Do the same thing again. Turn an empty roster slot first into Karis because you waited, and then turn it into Anthony Davis. Because, and this again, is not every team. I'm talking about teams that are in that weird in-between, where you're like in fourth place in Roto, you need to make your move. You probably shouldn't do it, by the way, because you're only going to get maybe 10 games out of him anyway. Uh, but, you know, maybe if you are want to make that big push at the end, and if you're in a games cap format and let's say you're, you know, running tight with the games cap, you, got, you can afford to stash a superstar for a couple of weeks, then that's probably the spot you consider doing it. And in head-to-head leagues, if you're in, this is what I was saying on Friday, like fourth ish place where you're looking at it and you're like i got no shot to beat that first place team if we went head to head right now i got to do something nuts that's where you consider doing it so take that top 80 guy and see if you can't turn him into a stashed first rounder i really do think ad's back within the next two weeks i could end up being wrong but it's a dice roll that i think is worth doing if your team needs the shake up that's such a big qualifier there that I'm hoping people didn't ignore because I said it on Friday's show and I'll say it again meanwhile the Lakers are are not good <laughs> uh Dennis Schroeder will generally be better than this Montrez has been decent enough uh and we'll see Andre Drummond probably you know maybe their next ball game or if not that one then likely the one after that and uh no I don't care about Taylor Horton Tucker having a slightly better ball game here they're not going to give him consistent minutes charlotte is without gordon hayward for at least four weeks that ended up being a worse injury than i thought at the time which means more of the guys that were already already asking quite a lot from terry rozier i'm betting you see the efficiency dip here with terry now being slotted in and and just having to have this massive usage role Devontae graham is going to have a lot of usage so he can slot in there I'm a little surprised P.J. Washington didn't do more in this particular ball game, but I think he's a guy you can go with. And then at this point now, with Miles Bridges having moved up the pecking order, by the way, Malik Monk is out for two weeks with his sprained ankle also. So they're really cut down to their prime in Charlotte. Some folks are picking up Brad Wanamaker. I don't think his fantasy game is good enough to warrant it. I would say, yeah, I mean, I think you can probably stream Miles Bridges at this point. He he almost has to. You guys know I don't like his fantasy game, and I'm not changing my opinion of him there. But he played the second most minutes on the team in this ballgame. He took the second most shots on the team in this ballgame. And it's almost, you look at it, and he kind of has to do enough. He's just going to be on the floor long enough to where he should have fantasy value for the next couple of weeks. So stream Miles Bridges. I think you can stream P.J. Washington. I don't know what the hell has been going on with him lately, but he'll likely be better than that. 
And then Rozier and Graham, who were, you were probably already starting because LaMelo Ball was out, now with Monk and Hayward out as well, those guys just power boost into the stratosphere. Meanwhile, on the Boston side, thanks to a blowout, we got sort of a weird mishmash of minutes played. Time Lord, who's going to be a real league winner the rest of the way, is, I mean, you really could not have spent enough to pick up or trade for that guy. Evan Fournier had another good ball game here off the bench. 17 points, 6 assists, 2 steals, and a block. This is an opportunity to sell if you are stuck with Fournier. If you had him in the league when he got traded and everybody said, oh, he's useless now, which, by the way, I think ultimately they're going to be right. He's had a couple of games where uh, Boston was missing a guy, and so he got a little bit more, and then this was a blowout, so he got to do a little bit more. It, it's not going to be this good every ball game. He's been hyper efficient here, canning all of his three pointers. He's a nice ad for them. But from a fantasy standpoint, he's buried way down the board. See if you can get off of him after two good ball games. And at this point, take whatever you can get. Go get a top 100 guy back and just call it a win if you can do it. In fact, let's put Fournier in the list of guys to talk about on social media today as well. So I'd love to see what public opinion looks like on him after two good ball games. Memphis beat Philadelphia on the road. Philly was resting Joel Embiid. I thought you might actually see an inspired performance from some of the other guys, but it was not to be. On the Memphis side, you got the usual. Now, when a blowout, this is a little bit more expected. Grayson Allen actually happened to have a pretty good ball game here, so I can't clobber him too much for playing him 26 minutes. Slow-mo was good again. JV was solid. Dylan Brooks actually wasn't bad, which I know defensively he's usually pretty good, but he was pretty good on offense too. Desmond Bain was was strong. They had seven players in double figures, and John Morant was not one of them, unbelievably. But the thing we're always watching with this team is the DeAnthony Melton stuff. Thanks to our uh, Hoopball Grizzlies correspondent here, David Williams, who we're going to have on the podcast later this week. DeAnthony Melton was playing very well. He got kind of rolled up on in this game on his leg, and it didn't really appear in many of the post-game reports. And that may partially explain why he got 15 minutes instead of 18 or 19. He was still awesome in his 15 minutes. 14, 3, and 3, four three-pointers and a block on five out of eight shooting. This kid is fantasy unreal. And that's why I just can't bring myself to move on from Melton. I can't do it. He's too good. If he ever saw a consistent run, I mean, the the world is absolutely his oyster. He's just... It's just not going to happen in terms of big minutes this year, but you'll take 18 to 23 most nights. Grayson Allen's actually trying to make a case for himself, but I'm not leaping in on that one. Warriors decided to just foul the Hawks in every possession. They lost 117-111. Hawks took 45 free throws in this game and won despite, despite shooting 43%. I mean, it was this was this was one of the slowest, most painful games that I've seen in a very long time. Kelly Oubre, who uh, decided to be Kelly Oubre for a game, that's something, I guess. Draymond, Steph, Wiggins, those guys are all doing fine. James Wiseman is getting crushed. He'll be better next year, I bet. It's going to be one of those situations where he's got to he's going to have to tune it out. Gallo feasted at the free throw line. Uh, Hawks decided to go with kind of a, a weird look, still without DeAndre Hunter, unclear if or when he's playing again this season. So they started Bogdan Bogdanovich and Kevin Herter in the back, uh, or on the wings, small uh, shooting guard and small forward in this game. Solomon Hill was a starting power forward with no John Collins. And then, you know, with that situation going on, Clint Capella grabbed 18 rebounds. No massive surprise there, given the other players on the floor. Uh, on the Hawks' side... We've been streaming Bogdan, and you can probably continue to do that. This game, he got two steals and five assists, and that really helped cover up some of the issues. But I say keep streaming for now. Sweet Lou is making a case to be rostered in points leagues. And if he's playing 26 minutes for this team, he, he almost definitely should be rostered in points leagues, so that's something to monitor as well. Not a category league guy. He needs 
He needs usage coming out of his ears to hit that marker. Uh, and, and, you know, teams are starting to take the ball out of Trey Young's hands. That's, that's the way clubs are playing the Hawks. The Warriors don't foul them every single time. They run away with this ball game. Kevin Herter is not, you don't need to be rostering him. Gallo, you do. And then we'll shake it all up again if or when Hunter and or Reddish resurface. Pelicans got Lonzo back, but no Zion or Brandon Ingram. Luckily, it was enough to beat the hapless Houston Rockets. Lonzo came back with a flurry. 27, 4, 9, 3 steals, 8, 3 pointers. Who the hell is this guy? We talked on Friday at great length about James Johnson being one of the greatest streamers in the history of the NBA. He missed four of his five free throws. That was pretty weird. But otherwise, this was an insane ball game for him. 18 points, seven boards, three assists, two steals, four blocks, and a three-pointer on eight out of 16 shooting. If he even goes three for five at the free throw line, it's the line of the night. Sadly, he did not. Nikhil Alexander-Walker uh, hurt his leg in this ballgame. Steven Adams got clunked in the head in this ballgame. Uh, the Pelicans are really beat to hell. I've got to think that at least one of the two power forwards, whatever you want to call them, small forwards, Brandon Ingram and Zion are the two guys I'm talking about. i got to think at least one of those two guys is back for their upcoming games on Tuesday and Wednesday. They've got a back-to-back, so maybe they play in half of them. Either way, I'm holding on to James Johnson until... I get word that everybody's back for the Pels. Because if that front court is missing one or two bodies, and if Adams has to miss a game or two now, I mean, this, he, he's, Johnson's so damn good. He's, he's the ultimate streamer. Because his fantasy game is, may, is arguably one of the best in the NBA when he's on the court. The, the issue is that he's generally not good enough to be a full time starter in the NBA from a just, from a reality perspective. What do we do with the rest of these guys is a good question because in this particular ball game, I mean, the Pels are now missing. If Adams and Walker are now out for some length of time, Zion, B.I., Josh Hart, it, what, what a disaster. You, you might see Willie Hernan Gomez do some stuff. I don't think I trust it because they did now finally give some run to Jackson Hayes, who might be worth looking at. But the Pels are also uh, fighting for that 10th and final play-in spot in the Western Conference. So I don't think that this is a true tank effort as much as it is they just got smacked with the entire team getting injured at the same moment, and they're just trying to tread water. So don't blow it all up yet. I don't think that you need to make any significant ads or drops. If you were hoping on Nikhil Alexander-Walker coasting the rest of the way, this probably eliminates that. We can get a timeline on it, but you're probably going to be moving on there. Over on that Houston side, uh, Christian Wood started and missed a bunch of free throws again. He's been weird lately. Jay Sean Tate had some foul trouble, which allowed Kelly Olynyk to play a few extra minutes, and Kelly's been insane since the trade. One of the better players in fantasy uh, since arriving in Houston. He is obviously a stronghold and start probably the rest of the way. I cannot believe I don't have him in more places after how many times I told you guys to pick up Olynyk this year. That's That hurts my soul. That really hurts my soul. Jay Sean Tate's a start. Uh, Kevin Porter Jr. is a start, although you're seeing some of the big issues here. Tons of turnovers. Not really ready to run an offense yet, but the ceiling is so damn high that you got to roll with it. Daniel House got hurt in this ballgame, uh, turned his ankle. He's out. I think they've got a back-to-back coming up tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so that just clears out a few more minutes for probably someone like a K.J. Martin. Would I stream him tonight? Uh, Probably not. Because Avery Bradley played, of all things. Orlando took a big lead over Denver, ended up coughing it up because, you know, look who they have to play right now. But there is some fantasy stuff to look at in this game. Aaron Gordon seems to have settled in very nicely. Denver did a good job of incorporating him without forcing the issue. And the Nuggets now are kind of a five-man beast. We're all season long. We were watching to see if any of these guys could step up and grab that power forward spot. Now it's Gordon's, and so we don't have to worry about it anymore. And I'm inclined, as I I talk about this, uh, the first thought that popped into my head was that moment at the end of The Fugitive. You know when uh, Tommy Lee Jones finally catches up to Harrison Ford. They're on that 
that platform with all the gear. It's a cleaning floor, I believe. By the, by the way, the one thing that always bugs me there is one of those little dangly cords hits Tommy Lee Jones in his giant ear. And at the very end, Harrison Ford leans... I think Tommy Lee Jones says something like, It's over! And Harrison Ford said, I, you know, I, I didn't kill my wife. or I, I don't remember what that last line is. And Tommy Lee Jones says, It's over, Richard. I know you didn't do it. He explains the whole thing. He says, You know, I'm glad. Because it's over. He's glad it's over. And that's what I feel with Denver. You know I'm glad. You don't have to watch this to see if there's anything going to happen anymore. We know exactly what's going on with the Nuggets now. You shelve them. Orlando, on the other hand, we cannot shelve because they are an amoeba of fantasy right now. A little blob reaching out in every direction trying to lure us. We know a few things about the Magic. We know Chuma Okiki is going to play a ton. We know Terrence Ross, when healthy, is going to take a lot of shots. And if he gets hot, I mean, yesterday you saw basically the basement of what the rest of his season can look. He's made a points league monster, and I think he'll probably have enough usage to be a nine-category guy as well. Third thing I think we know now is that Wendell Carter Jr. is the center. Took him a week to really let him settle in, and now they're turning him loose. 35 minutes in yesterday's ball game, 16-9-4, three steals and a block. Great. Wendell Carter Jr. is locked in. we got three guys you can reliably start on Orlando. The other stuff is a little bit of a question mark. James Ennis played 37 minutes in this game, lower usage than most of his teammates, but in this particular game, he actually did do enough. In general, I don't like his fantasy game, so I'm not diving in on that one. Also of note in this ballgame, Chasen Randall, who's playing on, from what we're led to gather, basically one working hamstring, was sent to the bench in favor of R.J. Hampton, who they got from Denver, and RJ played 33 minutes, had 16, 4, and 3 with two steals and two three-pointers. We don't know that much about RJ Hampton's fantasy game. We do know that no one on this team is really the point guard. The entrepreneurial spirit is resilient. And U.S. Bank is here to make sure that no matter what unknown pops up, business owners know that we have their back. Because problem solvers are the ones that keep us all moving forward by finding ways to close gaps, even when distances are being kept everywhere. So whatever you need to adapt and evolve your business, U.S. Bank is here to support you. U.S. Bank. We'll get there together. Equal housing lender, member FDIC. Well, they had 27 assists and not one player had more than five, but six players had three or more. So I don't think you can expect a traditional point guard line from Hampton. He's a guy that I would pick up in a points league probably now. And in a category league, I think you can wait and see a little bit because Michael Carter-Williams was out and Cole Anthony is still out. And so this whole thing is just going to get even more cluttered when those guys come back. What we don't know is would they slide RJ up to the shooting guard spot and and bench either Ennis or Bacon? Would Dwayne Bacon or James Ennis hit the pine? And so then they're starting Anthony and Hampton. I think it's going to get messy in Orlando. And I think... You probably don't see any of those guys actually hold on to fantasy value the rest of the way. I think you're probably going to get the main three. Okiki, Carter Jr., Terrence Ross. That's who I trust right now. If you want to spend a move on one of these other guys, you can. But I think you're probably going to end up moving on sooner than later. The only thing that, the only hang up there really is how long are these guys out? Michael Carter Williams is listed out with an illness. So presumably he'll be back relatively soon. Anthony's been dealing with that side rib core thing. And so he's supposedly close ish, but it's going to be, it's going to be a process. All right, onward and upward. We move back to Saturday. Dallas beat Washington in a game that was actually not as even as close as the 22-point final margin would indicate. Davis Bertans is back. He played 20 minutes. He's someone to watch, but I don't think you need to add him yet. And then with Dallas, Josh Richardson was out. Jalen Brunson's been on a little bit of a heater lately, and he gets a pretty big bump if either Hardaway or Jay Rich has to miss a ball game. Would I trust Brunson? I would not. No, I'm not adding him in. Uh, any place, really. And with Richardson now missing some time, I know that I've been kind of pro J. Rich. If this thing extends any further, then I'll pull the plug on that also. 
Knicks blew out the Pistons, and there's plenty of fantasy stuff to talk about in this ball game. On the Knicks side, Reggie Bullock has actually looked pretty good here lately. I, you know, there he had that one game coming back from his injury where he played like 20 minutes and had three and three. That's kind of driving his weekly averages down. But he's hitting a truckload of three pointers, and he's actually kind of getting confident enough to take shots. And some of that, I think, is just because the other starters on the Knicks, outside of Julius Randle, are not that great offensively. R.J. Barrett is fine. Alfred Payton is generally quite bad on offense. And Nerlens Noel doesn't look at his offense at all. Here's where I stand on the Knicks right now. Derrick Rose is probably at some point going to be a fantasy asset. But I do believe that he's dealing with some serious post-COVID after effects. And I don't know how long it's going to take to shake that off. So I think you can leave him on the wire for now. Alec Burks has had his job taken away by the return of Rose, Payton, and Bullock. You can drop him as well. Emmanuel quickly shouldn't even be on your radar right now. Payton is the starting point guard, and in a non-blowout, he probably ends up the guy taking the most minutes. He's not a category league guy, but he has shown himself this year at least to be uh, pretty close to a points league usable asset, and in a weird twist... And maybe there was an injury thing that was going on with him as well. Steals have been trending up for him finally after a weird low steals season for Alfred. And he's had those before. He had one uh, in New Orleans where he only had one steal in 30 minutes of ball game. But this year was particularly weird. I mean, he was at like 0.6 steals in 27 minutes a night. That was odd. That was way off for him. From a guy that, in his career, he's been like a a one-and-a-half steal per 36 kind of guy. Even last year in New York, he was at 1.6 in 28 minutes a game. So if some of that stuff is starting to come back for him, that would be uh, still not going to be enough to get him to a 9-cat level that I would consider using because both percentages are bad for Peyton. But it would probably power boost his points league stuff if you're getting a couple of points per steal that's actually a pretty big deal so Peyton more points league than anything and as we work our way up the board here uh I'm still starting New Orleans Noel I know that he didn't even attempt a shot in 24 minutes of this ball game but six boards and assists two steals and four blocks actually makes that line worthwhile and yes he's gonna lose time to Taj Gibson about once every two to three games and this is a blowout so they didn't need him later in this uh but here's where I'm at as we work our way up the chart. Nerlens Noel, add and start. Taj, you could probably stream him, honestly, if you find New York on a back-to-back. And then Reggie Bullock, I think I'm picking him up. Much as I don't think he's going to impress, really, with his numbers, he, you know, there's no real ceiling for him because he doesn't rebound very much. He doesn't pass very much. But he's on the floor 30-some-odd minutes. You're just going to sort of happen into one to two assists in that amount of time. And the key, I think, going forward here for Bullock is can he get his steals up over one? And if he can, he's probably inside the top 100. That's going to be the thing that makes the difference. Can the steals get up and over one? Because he's probably going to hit close to three threes a game. But it's that same damn stat set that you can get so many different places. The only thing that's nice about Bullock is you know Tom Thibodeau He's not going to yank his minutes. Once he picks his guy, Bullock's going to play 30-some-odd minutes a game. That's just, he's his guy now. Edgy Bullock seems like a good dude, by the way, just from what I've heard off-the-court stuff. It's all root for him. Pistons got waxed in this ballgame. Um, and, you know, I, I think we have to consider the possibility that they'll start to pivot but it's not entirely clear how they're going to do it. So you can sort of throw this game out, but at the same time, you can't really. First of all, Corey Joseph, who was playing well, he probably gets shoved out to the periphery now with both Killian Hayes and Dennis Smith Jr. making their returns on the same day. And they were both bad. Really, everybody was bad, other than Mason Plumley And Jeremy Grant was, ugh, but not terrible. Here's where we stand on the Pistons. Mason Plumley, you can keep using him until they actually do anything with his minutes. And no, I'm not worried about this one game because, again, they got destroyed. Uh, it sounds like he might be seeing a rest game coming up. 
which is going to make him a harder dude to start in head-to-head formats. Uh, Today's the front end of a back-to-back. And if that's going to start happening, then you can plan accordingly. So Isaiah Stewart is going to start to get these explosion games, and we're going to be ready for them. Today's a great day to use him. Stellar day to start Isaiah Stewart. Again tomorrow, he likely goes back into that timeshare where he'll play more like 20 minutes again. Which, by the way, he hasn't been that far off from value in 20 minutes of ball game, but it's not there yet. So he'll be spot starting in that spot. Wayne Ellington is also getting a rest day, and that means probably a little bit more Josh Jackson. I don't like Josh Jackson enough, really, other than, you know, your one-game blip. Ahamadou Diallo has also been sitting out some back-to-backs, and he's on a minutes restriction, so I don't know if that means... We haven't heard if he's going to be sitting out tomorrow's game, but either way, he's been good enough lately where he should be on fantasy teams. So Plumlee, Grant, Diallo are on fantasy teams for me. Killian Hayes is a guy you're grabbing in a dynasty format, but I do think that they slowly ramp his minutes up even this year to see what they've got. And it seems like he's really much more of a rebounding pass first point guard. We'll learn more about that in a little bit. The other question I have on this team is Dennis Smith Jr. I thought he had a window here before Killian Hayes came back to try to make a little bit of hay post deadline, but he couldn't get back before Hayes. And so now they're locked in against one another. Things have gotten a little slippery in Detroit. Uh, I'm still holding on Dennis Smith in a couple of Roto games cap spots just to see what happens with his minutes you got this back-to-back happening now. Uh, does he sit out one of the two games? Do his minutes ramp up? Do they stay relatively low? If they stay super low, I think we can move on, whether that's because of a timeshare or injury. But if the trend line looks good, then I'll stick with it a little bit longer because he was posting some really beefy fantasy stuff when he was filling in for DeLon Wright about a month ago. And that's where I sit on the Pistons right now. Sadiq Bey, by the way, I think you can probably... I mean, it's a similar thing to, like, Reggie Bullock. You need a starter that's going to hit you some threes, get you a few steals. That's kind of where you're at with that one. High floor, low ceiling, 3 and D kind of deal. Cleveland, still without Larry Nance and still without Jared Allen. I cannot believe that those guys aren't back yet, uh, particularly Nance, who's been listed out with a non-COVID injury for a full damn week now. What's going on there? I'd call it a tank, except, well, I guess you could argue that playing Kevin Love right now actually makes your chances of winning less, but I don't think that's actually true because the alternatives are real bad on that team. Kevin Love is addable in all formats, basically. I know you're going to miss the back-to-backs, but it seems like they're slowly increasing his minutes. And if he gets up into the 25 range, then he'll hit value in 9-cat. And definitely in points formats. Colin Sexton, he'll get all he can handle here as long as he's playing. Darius Garland, kind of a similar story there. Torian Prince looked really good off the bench, but he'll probably disappear once Larry Nance comes back, presuming Larry does come back. And then Isaac Okoro had a better ball game, but his usage just isn't enough night to night to make that thing worthwhile. Uh, Victor Oladipo trying to settle in with Miami, uh, but I don't know. He's a guy that right now is severely overrated on name recognition. Duncan Robinson is the story for the Heat. He's starting to heat up finally. Only took him four months to get there, but if he's floating around on a waiver wire, you probably should have picked him up. Cat, big game, played 44 minutes in regulation in this one. They just, I mean, Minnesota's bench is, is... so completely anemic that they left their starters in. They really wanted to make a statement here against the Sixers and Joel Embiid, and and they played relatively well, not well enough. Uh, But the notes certainly on this one, D'Angelo Russell, not back yet, but got upgraded from out to doubtful. So that means he's getting very close, and that means that Ricky Rubio, who already wasn't playing, is likely to pretty much disappear now. If uh, both Russell and Rubio are out, for Minnesota's next game coming up here this evening, then you can probably stream Jordan McLaughlin again. But certainly Jaden McDaniels is the one that we've talked about a lot in the podcast is a guy who, I don't know that his upside is still that majestic this year, bearing in mind that both Malik Beasley and Ricky Rubio and then leaning farther back, D'Angelo Russell, all those guys were out for this one. So you take those guys out, 
and he gets up to 10 shots, and that's a pretty big deal. Getting him up to 10 makes a difference because he's going to hit some threes. We need those rebounds. He got eight in this ballgame. That was a really big deal for his fantasy value, and then the blocks are always going to kind of be there. Now, if he's playing 35 minutes, he's probably going to get you one plus block per game and one plus three-pointer, but we need the th- we need the rebounds. That's the thing that makes the big difference here. And he got him. And he's a guy that belongs on fantasy rosters. I don't think I ever said the opposite of that. I just, you know, I, I do think that his upside is a bit capped when this team's fully healthy because he's not going to rebound as much, because he's not going to get those 10 shots. So just don't be blown away if this is the best run for McDaniels this year. And if you're in a keeper or a dynasty format, you got yourself a gem because he's a good young ball player. Nothing on the Sixers side. Talked to Orlando already. Nothing really on the Utah side. They're, they've been a fantasy tree trunk the whole year. Just have not moved a muscle. Indy beat San Antonio in overtime with no Demonis Sabonis and no Malcolm Brogdon. I think they expect or hope at least to have those guys back for the next ball game. In their absence, Justin Holiday uh, was a little bit better. He's been quite cold of late. Maybe he can get himself warmed back up again. TJ McConnell's going to have big ones anytime Malcolm Brogdon sits out. And then Miles Turner getting all the center minutes to himself. Not that he wasn't already having a really good fantasy season, but that's the ultimate for him. If he can just roll at center without Sabonis, he's a first-round guy, and it's not even close at that point. On the Spurs side... Uh, Kelton Johnson finally had a good ball game, but I do still think he's a drop in general. His game just isn't really built for category leagues because all he really does is score and rebound a little bit. And then everything else is fairly straightforward. Pirtle's been good. DeJounte's been good. Derek White's been good. DeMar's been not as good lately, but still fine. Milwaukee without Giannis beat Sacramento on the road. For the Kings, I keep watching DeLon Wright. He lost playing time in this one to Terrence Davis, one of their other trade deadline acquisitions, and for good reason in this particular ballgame. Uh, Darius hit, Davis hit seven three-pointers on his way to 27 points and only 14 shots. I do still think, uh, I'm going to say long-term, but kind of medium-term here, that DeLon probably is the guy in the 23-ish, 24-minute range. But now that we've given it a week and a half, and Wright hasn't been able to get up to 24 minutes, I'm willing to move on. I think you can move on. Um, you know, you could, you could let him go one more here and see what happens in a game where maybe Davis doesn't get lava hot, but, uh, it's, it's not looking at least in the short term, like DeLon's going to see enough time. And, and we're at a point in the fantasy season where you can't really sit on guys anymore. Uh, Bobby Portis got a chance to do a little bit more with Giannis out. Buck's a little dinged up right now. I, uh, yeah, I'm not, I don't mind it on the Portis thing. Thunder, this was a back-to-back for the Thunder. It was a really difficult scheduling spot. They were in Phoenix the night before. I had to fly all the way up to Portland. By the way, Arizona now is on Pacific time, so they didn't even get that extra hour turned back, and it, they looked every minute of it. Lost by almost 50 points. They just had nothing in the tank. Uh, on the Oklahoma City side, you know, we we lie in wait at this point. The uh, Isaiah Roby is in concussion protocol, so they just keep losing bodies. With no Roby and no po- uh, excuse me, no Baisley, then Alexei Pokashevsky should have more or less all the run he can handle, at least here in the relatively short term, and makes for a very interesting stream, just to kind of see how far this thing goes. Moses Brown, you're still using, but, you know, we're seeing the rookie. This, this is what happens with rookies. Sometimes it's just not that pretty. On the Portland side, Yusuf Nurkic didn't have to play very much because this was a crazy blowout, but he is slowly, slowly starting to get there. And this is why you say don't pre-drop anyone because Ennis Cantor has continued to hold value while the Blazers very slowly work Nurkic back in. Otherwise, uh, not much of note on that particular one. And then we'll play the game we always play at the end of our reverse chronological look back, which is Dan goes to the Friday card to see if any of these teams haven't been discussed. We didn't talk about Toronto, and we probably should because they blew out the Warriors by almost 60 points. <laughs> Gary Trent Jr. had a couple good ball games in a row. The things that are jumping out at me, well, first of all, uh, Kyle Lowry's out for a couple more ball games, and so that creates 
kind of a, a point guard vacuum and one game Trent actually did pass a little bit in this one Malachi Flynn was the guy who played a little bit better um I don't know man I don't know Gary Trent two very good ball games in a row I've already told you guys I've added him in every point type format league that I'm associated with but I remain skeptical that the field goal percent can be this good He's not going to hit six three-pointers a game. I, the steals and blocks, that's anomalous for him also. I, I know with Toronto, so one of the things the Raptors do that the Blazers didn't is they swarm a little bit more. They, they try to create a little bit of havoc on defense. Blazers try to play it a little bit more straight up, and maybe that's the kind of thing that'll lead to more defensive stats for Trent. So maybe steals go up a tiny bit for him in his new digs. But offensively, he's still going to be a gunner. Kyle Lowry, who's out, Freddie Van Fleet, both still in front of him in terms of orchestrating any offense. And then Siakam, too, depending on who else is on the floor, might be more of an initiator. So I don't know how rebounds or assists really change much for Trent. And if all you're adding to his Portland game is a, is a little more stealing, if it goes from point eight to one or something like that, he probably profiles as like a ninth rounder, which is fine. That's addable in nine cat leagues. He won't have value in eight cat leagues. We can fairly safely say that because turnovers are going to be probably one of his good notes. And he's going to score a fair amount for this team. because They take a ton of shots. They run. They fire three balls. So great. That's all well and good. I just, I don't know. Maybe you find someone that's willing to buy on Trent right now. And if that was the case, then I would happily sell. And we go back to the board now and try to figure out if there's anything else we missed over the weekend. And I think usually there's two. Aren't there usually two? What lines up? Who didn't play? Phoenix. There you go. See, I knew we'd figure it out eventually. Not that it matters. Phoenix, nothing ever ever changes down there. They're like Utah, man. You pretty much don't have to check them. And that is your reverse chronological lightning round. It's Monday, which means I have to tell you guys about our buddies over at mybookie.ag. Aren't they great? They gave us money for free last week. Baseball opening day. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Man, love it. Did you, I hope you guys got in with me on that. I hope as many of you as humanly possible got your $25 for free last week from my bookie. Actual dollars. Actual dollars. I've already cashed some of mine out. Just put that, put them ducats in my pocket. It was so easy. So easy. So please do sign up with our buddies over at mybookie.ag. Use promo code HOOPBALL on the third page of sign up. And that is how they'll know who sent you. It'll also unlock some deposit bonuses when you do then make your initial deposit after the sign-up process. So you won't actually see any... It won't, like, flash some stars or confetti or anything when you input that promo code, but it'll make sure that you can use some of their built-in promos on your first deposit. Again, the website over there is mybookie.ag. You bet you win. They pay. And odds boosts are so much fun. They are so much fun. Reminder again, we are recruiting. Let this be the day. Come on, guys. Come bug me. I say make a career change, but it's it's more complicated than that. Get your foot in the door. Break in. Seven game Monday. Relatively short Monday card compared to uh, recent big ones. Knicks are in Brooklyn. Battle for New York. Sounds like James Harden is back, which makes Brooklyn much scarier. And, uh, yeah, nothing really to watch on that Brooklyn side other than it sounds like Blake Griffin's sitting this one out. But if LaMarcus Aldridge isn't, if he's playing on back-to-backs now, uh, I think that solidifies him as a potential fantasy asset. For the Knicks, we were talking about uh, Reggie Bullock as an intriguing 3 and D guy who's just playing gigantic minutes. So he sort of ends up in that what used to be known as the Marvin Thad line, but now that Thaddeus Young is a fantasy gold mine in 25 minutes a game, I'm going to have to change the name of the Marvin Thad line, named after our good buddy Marvin Williams, who had fantasy value, but only when he hit 30 minutes a game. 
Anything under that? Nope. Anything over that? Yep. And I think Reggie Bullock falls into that. The uh, other note on the Knicks side is, well, I mean, that's really the the big chunk there. Because I don't think, we, we went through that whole team in our reverse chronological lightning round, and I, I don't think that anything else is really up in the air. Cleveland still somehow missing all of their normal centers, so you can, I guess, you can start Kevin Love. I ain't digging too deep on this team. Spurs... We know what to expect. Washington, waiting on the health of Bradley Beal. That's the only thing that's changing anything on that club. Toronto, keep an eye. We're Well, you know, it's not even an eye at this point. Is We're monitoring Gary Trent Jr., and that's another one. That's the third name we'll take over to social today. Gary Trent, really curious what people think about him. I think most folks are higher on him than I am, which may create a value pocket for us. I don't know. Do you guys... Well, I guess you can't respond because this is a recorded podcast, but do you guys... Still have trades open in your leagues? Because mine are generally still open. I set the trade deadlines in all of my commissioner leagues quite late. I think it's fun. So why cut it off early? Seems dumb. If you're worried about collusion, get better people in your league. Or run your league, and then you don't have to worry about it. If somebody's colluding, you can just smack them right out of the league. In any event, Sacramento, keep an eye on Delon Wright. This may be sort of Delon's last stand. If he can keep a spot on my fantasy roster, you guys have probably all moved on. I'm more patient with him just because we know the upside. Minnesota Timberwolves, do we get any better news about D'Angelo Russell? Being upgraded to doubtful is actually a pretty good thing. Uh, Really, it's weird to change his status from out to doubtful if you still thought he was not playing. You could really just do nothing at that point. This is a suggestion that there's actually a small chance he gets into the ballgame and plays 10 minutes. Detroit, with a bunch of guys resting, you're going to see Isaiah Stewart get picked up a bunch after this ballgame, and then you're going to see him dropped a bunch after tomorrow's when Mason Plumlee's back in there. But the thing I really want you guys paying attention to is the point guard rotation. Do, do any of these guys actually rise up? Can the cream rise in that Detroit point guard battle now? Because they're all over the map. Oklahoma City, uh, we talked about them just a minute ago. I think you can mostly avoid the backcourt. Although this should be a good, very competitive ball game among tanking teams. Who can lose better? Moses Brown should have some fun here. I don't, is Jeremy Grant still playing for Detroit? He, he really looks like he could use a day off. Utah, nothing. Dallas, nothing. Phoenix, nothing. And then Houston, uh, no John Wall. Sounds like he wants to come back and play again starting on Wednesday. So I guess he's not out for good. And we just got news as we were on air that DeAndre Hunter is undergoing a knee procedure and that he'll be out a couple of days, whatever that means. It's not a season-ending procedure, but it's some sort of follow-up to the knee surgery. We kind of knew that something weird was going on. Uh, Hopefully they go into some more detail, but it's really hard to hold on to him after this type of absence and now hearing that some actual small surgery is occurring. So I'm okay with you guys moving on. They're going to be they're going to be careful with him when they finally do bring him back after all of this. And so I think if we've been sitting on him, you probably just have to cut your losses. And it's been unfortunately some pretty severe losses. It says this is a stash gone wrong when stashes go wrong. And that, ladies and germs, is it. That's the Monday pod. Again, we're going to take this thing on to social because I got some questions on a few players where I think perhaps our assessment here on Fantasy NBA Today doesn't necessarily match up with that of the fantasy community at large. And if we can create a value pocket, that might create an opportunity to either buy or sell and either nab a good player or get out from under one that maybe we see the bottom getting ready to fall out. Okay, Larry Markin and Evan Fournier, Gary Trent Jr. That was the list. I'm glad I wrote them down. I am Dan Vespers for Fantasy NBA Today. Recruiting, it's happening. Hope to hear from you. If not, I'll talk to you guys tomorrow morning. We'll yell at you about it again. So long, everybody.
This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.